you may notice we are not the normal worship team. And you'd be dead on because everybody up here, there's nothing normal about us. <clears throat> we are uh, Bitter Lake Creek Revival, and we're very thankful for the opportunity to come and worship with you guys this morning. Each of us is uniquely gifted, but this is one of those instances where the sum is greater than individual parts. We each felt called to spread the love of Jesus, and we decided we could be much more effective together than apart. So we sat down, and with considerable combined brain power, we came up with the mission statement. Now, you have to understand this, but we have folks like our resident Texican, Mark, who's fluent in Texican, and we came up with this mission statement by folks that speak a lot gooder than me. The Darn Blue Grass Band, Bitter Lick Creek Revival, exists to rile up and spur on God's children, to get nearer to the heart of Jesus through some mighty fine picking and hollering, and to spread the good news and joy of God's favor. Some of today's songs, thank you, some of today's songs will be pretty familiar to you guys, but there may be a couple that you're not quite up on. But I do pray that as you listen, your heart will, will be brought closer to Jesus. So I say, let's get to doing some picking. So aimless, I filled with sin. I wouldn't let my dear Savior in. Then Jesus came like a stranger in the night. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light, I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. Back to say, praise the Lord, I saw the light, I saw the light, I saw the light, no more darkness, no more night, now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside, praise the Lord, I saw the light, thank you, Jeff. Yeah. 
like a cross I will ever be true in shame and reproach gladly bear then he'll call me someday to my home far away where his glory forever I'll share so I cherish the old happy cross till my joy Thank you. 
That was probably a new one for you, but it's a good one. This is going to be a clapper. Take a deep breath. <laughs> Father, we are so grateful beyond measure for this opportunity to come before and lift up your name in worship. I'm so thankful for each person here, and thank you for bringing us all together this morning. We all come here in, from different places in our lives right now, and each of us at varying walks with you. But I pray that no matter where that is, that our songs and our teachings open our hearts and minds and bring 100% focus on you. Father, we lift up Mike this morning. Give him courage and strength of his convictions to preach the gospel. We strive to bring God's love to a world solely and sorely in need of your love. And I pray that this community would see through the members of this congregation your love and your grace. And Lord, let us uh, boldly go out into our communities 
and show them your love. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Welcome. Good morning. Yeah, it's good morning. A um, couple things. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad to be here. If you are new this morning, uh, our Sunday mornings kind of look like this. We are traveling through the New Testament chronologically. This morning, we find ourselves in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 9. So in the next few minutes, if you want to flip there in a Bible, that'd be awesome. Uh, there is some red Bibles under the seats in front of you. If you don't have one, you can pull it up on your whatever device. Uh, so that, that's, that's where we are this morning. i catch you up on some things that are going on just because, like, here's, here's why... I don't like to belabor Sunday mornings. This is precious time. But the idea is when you're part of a church body, this should be a body that ministers to you, that pours into you. But it's also a place where you should come and minister. So we want to provide opportunity for people to do both of those. Find places where you can be ministered to. Find places where you can use the gifts God's given you to minister. So that, that's why we're going to just keep updating you on what's been going on, what is going to be happening. Uh, real quick. This last week was middle school camp. We partnered with Trail Christian Fellowship and did our middle school camp. And I would encourage you to talk to some of our middle schoolers, talk to Norm about how that went. Real quick, I believe we had three for sure, possibly four young people give their lives to the Lord for the very first time. So that is amazing. Yeah. So, so cool. Please talk, talk to Norm about just some things that the Lord did through our middle school camp. Uh, also, we have a table out there with some ministry stuff coming up. I would encourage you to check that out. Men, women, there's different studies. One of the ones is we're going to start a women's Bible story study through the book of Philippians. Uh, Jeanette Bailey is going to be leading that on Fridays from 9.30 to 11.30, starting on the 26th. So if you're interested in plugging into that, ladies, please do that. Um, this, this one's going to push me out of my comfort zone, which is probably a really good thing. Back when, when I was teaching through 1 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, we came to chap, uh, chapter 5, verses 19 through 22, and it talked about not quenching the Spirit's fire, not treating prophecies with contempt, but to test everything and hold on to the good. And, and I, I kind of gave us a route forward for what it might look like to actually do that practically as a church body. And I'm guessing if, if you're someone here, you've had one of two experiences with gifts of the Spirit in a corporate setting. And one, that those have been diminished to almost nothing because it, it, it's just not appropriate or it's not in play anymore. And it's been very uh, traditionally like pushed to the side. Or you've come from experience where it is the main thing and it is front and center. And, and that, I believe both of those approaches are inappropriate for how we can look at gifts of the Spirit. So we, we tried to craft, myself and the elders, a way forward into this that is both biblical and appropriate in a large corporate gathering. And here's what we came up with, just want to refresh your memory, is that if someone felt like the Holy Spirit laid something on their heart, a word of encouragement, a word of prophecy, that we were not going to deny that. And here's the route forward, is they would bring that to the elder board. And the first thing we would do is confirm that this is a person that is walking with Jesus, not a new believer, not a non-believer, is we can test the character and faith of this person. The second step would be to see if it is in alignment with Scripture. The third step would be to see if it is for the edification of the body at large. And if it passes all three of those tests, we talked about how we would share that, if appropriate, from the pulpit Sunday morning so that people could be built up and encouraged, and that would be appropriate. And we would not make this a main thing ever, but we don't want to quench the Spirit which is what the Word talks about. So uh, if, if you're like me, this has been a struggle my whole life, is what does it look like to practice gifts of the Spirit in my own life individually, let alone in a corporate setting, and, and trying to do these two things. And I think it, we can all relate to this on some level. What does it look like to bring our theology and our practice into alignment? We say we believe certain things. And yet our practice does not always reflect the fact that we say those things that we believe in. And trying to bring our theology and our practice into alignment is like a constant Christian struggle through our life. Let me just give you an example. Anybody here worry? You can go ahead and raise your hand, unless you're worried about being judged. That's, so, so, so I worry, and yet I say God is sovereign and powerful and good. Are those two things in alignment? No. So I'm in, the, I'm in a battle of trying to bring my worry in alignment with the sovereignty of God. 
Okay, so, so here's an example in spiritual gifts is I say, yes, I believe that, that the Holy Spirit works powerfully. I believe that people can be healed and people can prophesy and people can speak in tongues. And I say all that and yet I participate in that not at all. And actually sometimes I'm a little closed off to it. And quite, if I'm just being real with you, I'm a little skeptical, right? But I'm trying to do this. I'm trying to bring what the Word says in alignment with my life and actually living that out. So we're about to do that. We had a man come to us a few months ago, and he had a cool word of encouragement, and, and I'm going to share it with you here this morning, not because I have to, because I believe this is the best route forward for our body at this time, and if this touches your heart in some unique way, I would love to know about it, so I can be encouraged by that, I can encourage this man. Um, I share that with you because this is new. I, I've never walked down this path before, and, and bringing our theology and our practice in alignment is never a comfortable thing. It always kind of breaks off some rough edges in our life. So I'm going to share this with you. I hope for somebody here, this supernaturally encourages your heart this morning. The word is this, when you sit in his lap and lean into him, you can feel his love. And if you press your head against his chest, you can hear his heart for you. As I read that, I believe there's probably somebody here this morning that doubt God's the Father's heart for you. That you doubt that he's actually for you. Maybe you have a, a broken experience with your dad and you're used to you know, the wagging finger, the crossed arms. Maybe you've never got to lay your head on the Father's lap and just hear how much he loves you. God the Father loves you. He loves you so much that he sent his son to die for you. Not to condemn the world, but to save the world through that act of Jesus. I hope, hope that encourages you here this morning. Yesterday afternoon, I got a call from a good friend. He said, Mike, the president's been shot. Not what I was expecting to hear yesterday afternoon. For, I'm just going to make sure everyone's on the same page. Yesterday, former President Trump, uh, there was an assassination attempt against his life. He was shot at. It grazed his ear. Uh, I believe the gunman was killed. Other people were killed and wounded. It was a horrific scene. If you guys have seen some of the footage, it is nothing less than just horrible. That violence on that level would be enacted against any human being, let alone someone that's trying to run for the most powerful position in the world, quite honestly. Now, you can take or leave your thoughts on President Trump or Biden. Let's just leave those at the door. This is a human being. This is an image bearer. And this level of violence, while I was completely caught off guard by that and shocked by, by the visual scenes, after thinking through some of the rhetoric politically in our country, it actually shouldn't be overly shocking. That the sides are so uh, amassed against each other that, that the fact that someone, uh, unstable as they might be, would try to commit violence to perpetrate an act like that is, should not be shocking because the political rhetoric in our country is just that angry. Like, it's just like, if you vote for this candidate, if you believe in that candidate, if you don't believe in voting, like whatever it is, you're killing people. Blood is on your hands. And, and the more we talk like that, the more it actually sounds like, well, maybe violence is the answer, if that's the only answer left. And that is inappropriate. And so I'm going to lead us in some prayer. I, I believe it is up to the church. It's not up to the army or the politicians. Uh, it, it's certainly not up to people living in darkness. It's up to Christians to start not making less of what we believe but speaking and treating one another as image bearers in love. That is the, we're going to get into some stuff this morning that's going to rub us a little, uh, it's going to make us uncomfortable. It's up to us Christians to say, you know, I'm not going to fall into the CNN, Fox News, political rhetoric trap of, of those people, the people that don't believe like I do, that want to vote for the different person than I do, that they are the problem. We got to get out of that trap. It doesn't mean we make less of our convictions. It doesn't mean we change the way we vote. It doesn't mean any of that. I actually think it's up to Christians to hold strongly to our convictions in politics and to engage, and yet we do it in a way where we actually try to hear the other people, like really hear where they're coming from, find commonality when we can, and speak intelligently, not angrily towards that other party. So what I want to do is pray for our country because I think it needs it. It feels very much not like the United States. It feels like the divided politics of America. So I would... I would encourage you to pray with me. I would encourage you to continue praying for our country, that we would be able to find some common ground on the biblical foundations that we were founded on, 
and actually Christ-like behavior that we're expected to portray. And as the church, hopefully we can kind of just tone down some of the rhetoric in our country right now. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that Donald Trump was not killed yesterday. Thank you that that bullet three inches the other way didn't go that way, Lord. Thank you for sparing his life. I, I also just pray for the families of the people that lost loved ones yesterday. Lord, I pray for the family of the gunman. I pray for the family of the people in the crowd that were just going there to support their candidate and lost their life. I pray for comfort. I pray somehow through this, Lord, that they would know you or know you better. Lord, that you would work all things for good for those that are loved you and called according to your purpose in this horrible event. Lord, I pray this would serve as a reminder to tone down just the anger, the animosity. Lord, may we as Christians think biblically about politics. May we think biblically about your candidates. May we know clearly how to vote this November. But Lord, may we know what it looks like to come alongside our friends and neighbors and family that think differently on those issues. To be able to hear them and talk with them. Lord, when appropriate, try to change their mind if need be. But I pray for our country. I pray as people are disorientated and lost and angry, God, that they would turn to you, that they would not turn to a false god or themselves, that they would not circle up in their little echo chambers, Lord. May they listen to your spirit. May they be hungry for your word and find community in Christian circles. May the church lead in this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. So 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We're not jumping in to a new story here, so I feel like I need to set some cultural tones. My dad started it off last week with chapter 8, but really if we take chapter 8, 9, and 10, and really all the way through 11, 1, this is one cohesive teaching here. And so let me just give you a little bit of background. So my dad talked about last week, there was some Christian elites. And let's, when I think of elite, this is like my picture. I know this is probably more 15th century than 1st century. Go ahead, Israel. Uh, this is kind of what I have in mind is we got these guys standing around. They're super puffed up. I, I would imagine these were people that came out of the Greco-Roman world, and they're the philosophers and the rhetor, rhetoricians and sophists, and they're the pol political leading class. They've come to Christ, and their idea of what it looks like to be a Christian is what we talked about last week is knowledge. We just need to know all the things, have the right answers, be explained why you're wrong and you're wrong and you're wrong on those things, but I'm right. Let me explain why. And these people, as they came to Christ, they realized, oh, Eating food sacrificed to idols, not a big deal. Idols aren't even a thing. We can eat all we want. Let's eat. This is not a big deal. And they used their freedom that they got from the knowledge, sacrificing intimacy with God to eat whatever they wanted. And at the same time, they had the fresh out of the temple prostitute, the fresh out of the pagan leader come in there, and they're leading these people astray. They're, they're eating the bacon just sacrificed to Zeus. And the temple prostitute's like, you can't do that. And, and, and maybe the Greco-Roman person that just got saved is like, no, this is, that was just sacrificed on an idol to Poseidon. Like, that, 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 that's inappropriate. And, and the knowledgeable people are puffed up. And, oh, you don't know. You don't know. You're just this weak little baby Christian. And Paul leans into him hard. And he says this in, in 8, 9, Be careful, however, that the exercise of your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. See, the idea was there is freedom in Christ. But we talked about this a lot in Galatians. It's not freedom from regulation. It's freedom to live for Jesus. And the elite Christians in that day, I don't mean mature, I mean elitist, had forgotten that. So as we enter into chapter 9, Paul's going to be doubling down on this statement that the, that the exercise of your freedom not become a stumbling block. He's going to end this section. I'm going to tell you how he ends it. It's in 11.1. One. If you want to turn the page there, Paul says this, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. That's how he closes this section. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. And, and I want to remind us that what we're going to read today is Paul largely talking about the example he left for them. What does it look like to be a Christian living in freedom with certain rights? 
Now, now the Greco-Roman world would have understood social, ethical, political, legal rights. Certain people had no rights. But to a Roman, another Roman had rights. To a Greek, other Greeks had rights. I'm just going to define it according to Webster. Rights are legal, social, and ethical principles of freedom and entitlement. So Paul's going to jump in in nine. He's laid out this, hey, it's not about knowledge, it's about intimacy, and you don't ever use your freedom to cause your brother to stumble. And now in chapter 9, he's going to say, and this is how I've done this. Primarily, there's a lot of secondary principles that we could take out of this. You want to know how to treat your ox when you go home this afternoon? We could take this out of this. You want to know whether a soldier or a farmer or a shepherd should get paid? We could, we could take this out of this, right? We could find out how much a preacher maybe should make or not make based on these chapters. None of that is the primary theological point. I'm just going to give it to you up front. Here, here, here's what Paul's trying to say. As a believer, for the sake of the gospel, sometimes you've got to lay down your rights. For the sake of the gospel, American Christians, sometimes we lay down our rights. And as a matter of fact, anything that hinders the advancement of the gospel should be laid down. Paul's not primarily talking about oxen and soldiers and freedom and food here. He's saying, look at me, guys, check this out. I don't care what it is, I will lay it down. I have every right to take it. I will lay it down so that the gospel is not hindered. Let's go 1 through 14. He's going to ask 12 rhetorical questions here. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not the result of my work in the Lord? Even though I may not be an apostle to others, surely I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is my defense to those who sit in judgment on me. Don't we have the right to food and drink? Don't we have the right to take a believing wife along with us, as do the other apostles and the Lord's brothers and Cephas? Or is it only I and Barnabas that must work for a living? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its grapes? Who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk? Do I say this merely from a human point of view? Doesn't the law say the same thing? For it is written in the law of Moses, do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. Is it about oxen that, the God, that God is concerned? Surely he says this for us, doesn't he? Yes, this was written for us. Because when the plowman plows and the thresher threshes, they ought to do so in the hope of sharing in the harvest. If we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much that we reap a material harvest from you? If the others have this right of support from you, shouldn't we have it all the more? But we did not use this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than hinder, hinder the gospel of Christ. Don't you know that those who work in the temple get their food from the temple? As those who serve in the altar share in what is offered on the altar. In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. Okay. Paul's not asking questions. He's making points. And here's his point. Culturally speaking, whether you were a Christian apologist evangelist or you were a secular sophist or philosopher, you would travel around and you would expect as you came into different communities that those communities would support you. They would either give you money to speak, they would give you a place to stay, in some way they would support you. That was expected of Christian traveling people. It was, it was, it was common in every culture. And Paul is actually saying, this is what is actually right and fair. It is my right to do this. Am I apostle? Yes. Are you the fruit of my ministry? Yes. Have I seen the risen Christ? Yes. And, then he, and so he goes from like a personal example, and then he goes in and he starts talking uh, specifically about giving examples of a soldier. Do soldiers get paid? Yes. Do those who plant a vineyard eat of its grapes? Of course they do. Do those who tend the flock get milk to drink? Of course they do. So there's the personal example, there's the societal examples, and then he goes to examples from the Old Testament. Do you muzzle the ox when it treads grain? No. Is God primarily talking about oxen in Deuteronomy 25? No. He's saying, man, if you preach the gospel, you should get paid for that. Paul is saying, I have every right to get paid by y'all. I have every Man, you have a responsibility to pay me. It is my right that you pay me. And yet, he says, I'm going to set that right aside. 
Because if I expect or I take payment from you, I'm going to look like every other traveling philosopher, politician, evangelist, false prophet. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to take what is rightfully mine and I'm going to set it aside, what he says, so nothing could possibly hinder the gospel. Nothing could possibly hinder his proclamation of the good news to the people in Corinth. I'll comment briefly on verse 14 just to get the awkwardness out of the way. It says, In the same way the Lord has commanded those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. One of the more awkward verses for me to preach on. I'll, I'll just say this. For those of you, and I believe it is most of you, although I don't know, thank you for giving to this church. You pay my salary. I appreciate that. And it's appropriate. I believe as a minister of the gospel, as a full-time vocation, it is appropriate that I get paid for this service. I believe I should get paid in a way that does not make me beg or grovel or live below a poverty line. And in no way should ministers live above that. I think there's a balance there that we need to hit. I'm thankful for the elders in this church and the congregation here for providing that for me and others. I think a minister of the gospel should never make more than they can make in the secular field so that they ensure it is a calling and not just a place where they can make the most money. I believe this church and many other churches in the valley hit that mark. And when I see pastors flying around in planes or begging on the streets, that bothers me because I do not believe that's biblical. So I will leave it at that. Thank you. Let's keep going in verse 15 through 23. But I have not used any of these rights, and I'm not writing this in the hope that you will do such things for me. I'm going to stop there. Paul's not being passive-aggressive asking for money, right? He's not just like, well, it sure be nice to get paid. They all get it. I'm just like, hint, hint, hint. Paul's like, if you tried to pay me, I wouldn't even accept it. He's going to tell us why. I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of this boast. What boast? What boast? you say? The boast that nothing is hindering his gospel proclamation. Nothing can hinder Paul's gospel proclamation. If anything could, he's saying, I'd rather die than, than walk into that. 16, yet when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, for I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. If I preach voluntarily, I have a reward. If not voluntarily, I am simply discharging the trust committed to me. What then is my reward? Just this, that in preaching the gospel, I may offer it free of charge and so not make use of my rights in preaching it. I'm going to stop there before we do 19 through 23. Let me just try to summarize what Paul is saying here. What he's saying, I would rather die than have the gospel hindered. He goes on, he says three things. First, I, first, I think he's saying, I would actually pay to do this. I know you guys are trying to pay me, but I am so compelled to do this. I, I would pay for the privilege of sharing the gospel. convicting. Let me ask you this. What if work was not primarily an obligation but an opportunity for service? What if your place of work, what if your living room, what if the golf course, what if the cubicle was not primarily an obligation? Oh, I got to stand with my kids. Oh, I got to go to the construction site today. Oh, I got to go to the office. Okay, let me, let me Frame this a different way. How many people here have ever gone on a mission trip? Raise your hand. Any mission trip? Kid, adult? And Okay, how many people have paid to go on a mission trip? Yeah, I have. Lots of us have. Okay, so rather than paying money to go on a mission trip, what if I told you you could get paid to go on a mission? What if you could make minimum wage to go on a mission? $20 an hour, $25, $50,000 a year, $100,000 a year. What if I told you there's opportunities out there to get paid to be a missionary? There is. It's called work. Go do that. That's what Paul's saying. You don't need to pay me. I would pay to go share the gospel. 
cool if the American church thought of work like that. I actually think many of us do. He's saying this is a responsibility. I did not choose this, but I was chosen. I'm compelled is what he says. Therefore, he could not demand pay any more than he could demand pay for breathing. Next, he actually did receive a word. He did get paid. That he could preach the gospel free of charge. This is, this is Paul's understanding of his preaching the gospel is the reward is there. What a delight and a joy to see men set free from the bondage into the kingdom of God. That's Paul's payment. Let me, let me ask like this. Let's just say, downtown Eagle Point, there's a maximum security prison. And somewhere in the belly of that prison is an infirmary. And somewhere in that infirmary is someone that's been locked up their whole life. And they're actually dying of cancer. They're going to die in the belly of this prison from cancer. And I, said, and I said this. This person just got pardoned. Completely pardoned. And we actually have some medication that can heal them on the spot. Who wants to go give them the good news? That's, that's payment. Can you imagine the look on that man or woman's face? You get to go to prison and say, hey, your chains have been free. You have been pardoned. Your cancer is cured. I have the medication. I don't know if you guys have seen this on the news. This, this in, richest guy in Asia got married this weekend, something. Uh, I didn't read it. I just like look at the headlines. Richest guy in all of Asia. His son gets married this, this weekend. Multi, multi, multi. Like Justin Bieber was singing at the, at the rehearsal. So, so imagine that scale. So let's just say you go to this prison. By the way, you're set free. By the way, we're going to heal your cancer. By the way, this guy in Asia just adopted you into his family. So you're going to get on a plane flight. You'll be like richest family in the world. Who would want to go give that good news? That would be awesome. <laughs> That's what Paul's saying. I don't need to be paid. I would pay to do this. I'm actually compelled to do this. And by the way, I get paid the kind of riches you can't imagine. I get to see people go from death to life into the inheritance of the kingdom of God. You can't beat that reward. 19 through 23. Though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law though I myself am not, under the law, uh, am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I'm under the law of Christ. So as to win those not having the law, to the weak I became weak. To win the weak, I have become all things to all men, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings." Let me just quickly dispel any thought that Paul's saying, do whatever you want. Cast your morals aside. Man, you want to minister to the people at the bar? Like, pick up a half rack and head on down to Willie's. He's, he's not saying that. He's like, man, I just want to minister to the people in the marijuana industry, so I'm going to start smoking weed. He's not saying that, right? He's like, man, I want to minister to the temple prostitutes, so I'm just going to sign up to be a prostitute. No, 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 no. Paul's not saying that. <laughs> he's not saying you get to be a hypocrite, Ever. He's not saying that you get to compromise your morals or alter truth, ever. It doesn't mean that like, well, when I go into this group that thinks truth is like up to them, that I get to speak the gospel truth, what's ever in them, and these people that, he's not saying that. You don't alter the gospel, you don't become a hypocrite, you don't take on sin. Here's what he is saying. Paul was like the most Jewish guy ever. He, he kind of talks about this in Philippians 3, 4 through 6. He's like, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin, circumcised on the eighth day, Pharisee of all Pharisees, perfect according to the law. Like, he had the Jewish thing down pat. And yet, his identity was that I will become a Jew to reach the Jews. Wait, but Paul, you're a, you are a Jew. He's like, no, no, my primary identity is in Christ now. I will become all things to all men so that I might reach them with the gospel. Do you hear what he's saying? He's, he's saying what he's been saying this whole chapter. I will take my rights. I will take my heritage. I will take whatever I have. And I will lay it down so it does not hinder the gospel. Barclay says this. 
It's having a readiness to throw oneself at, to, into the interests of other people. Another theologian talked about it like this. I, I like the way he says this. Becoming all things to all men means this. Learning the art of getting alongside someone. Learning the art of getting alongside someone. When was the last time you kind of set yourself aside for a moment and you came alongside someone for the sake of the gospel? When was the last time you saw someone with a yard sign or a bumper sticker or a Facebook post that was completely against everything you politically believe? And rather than just like hate mailing them, disparaging them, belittling them, you said, man, I would, I would love to hear why you think that. And you just kind of come alongside and you listen to their story a little bit. And maybe you don't try to change their mind about the politics for the sake of the gospel. Learning the art of getting alongside someone. 24 through 27. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run. I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body and I make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. The Corinth would have perked up when Paul started talking like this. Wait, games? Running? Wrestling? Fighting? We, we know this. So in Corinth, they had the Isthmian Games, every two years, second only to the Olympic Games. And they would run and they would fight. They would wrestle. And athletes would have to go into strict, strict training then. We, we know that from them then, and they would do it to w win this laurel wreath crown. And we understand that the Summer Olympics are like two weeks in Paris. And, and I've been doing a little bit of research just because of this chapter. I'm not a huge Olympic fan, but I've been doing a little research just because the hype and the level of training that the athletes have now is very similar to what it would have been like back then. Something cool just to recognize is 100 years ago, this year, the Olympics were in Paris, and there was a guy named Eric Liddell that ran in those games. We got a picture of him, I think, we're going to throw up. That's him, rugby player. Amazing sprinter, best 100-meter sprinter in the world, and he goes to Paris to do the 100 meters. He's going to smash everyone, and he find out, finds out the race is on Sunday. He says, I'm out. Man, he had trained decades to get to Paris in the Olympics and represent, and people called him all sorts of names. He was going to win the gold for Great Britain, and people thought, you're anti-patriotic. You're denying your country. Man, but his conviction that nothing would hinder his walk with the Lord was so strong he passed. Flash forward 100 years, there's another Christian that's going to be going to Paris. Just, you know, she's probably there right now. Her name's Allison Felix. Most decorated track and field athlete in the world. She's going to Paris. And I read a little of her story, what her training regiment looks like. She just goes, trying to get in the mind of what Paul would have been talking about when it talks about training and competing for an eternal prize and its similarity to what it looks like to a temporary prize. So, most decorated track and field athlete in the world. And in about 2018, she was sponsored by Nike. And Nike, and, and she decided, I'm going to be a mom. And she got pregnant with her husband. And Nike cut her contract. Said, we will not support. So the, the hidden history behind that is when female track and field athletes would get pregnant, their sponsors would tell them to get rid of that child. You're going to lose your career. You're going to lose your sponsorships if you have a baby as a track and field athlete. And she said, heck with that. I want to be a mom. I'm going to keep this child, and I will compete again. I believe it was in the Tokyo Olympics. She won gold after having a baby. She's going back to Paris this year, not as an athlete, but to start a nursery in the Olympic Village. Like carrying on the tradition of what it looks like to be a godly athlete and actually put Christ first. So, anyway, so her training regiment was this when she was competing. It'd be like six to ten hours of day of training. She'd wake up, she'd spend an hour with her child. And then she'd go right to the track. She'd spend an hour warming up. She'd run. She'd drill. She'd sprint. She'd do all these things. She'd leave there. She'd go to the weight room. She'd lift weights. She'd do plyometrics. She'd, she'd lift. This was, then she'd go and she'd have counseling. And then she'd go do like cryotherapy and sauna and she'd stretch, do all these things. Eight hours a day 
for like the last, she retired as I think one of the oldest athletes ever. She retired when she was 38. She did this for multiple decades. It wasn't just the training eight to 10 hours a day. It was the nutrition. She knew what she was going to eat, man, months in advance. She had a plan for that. It was the psychology of it. It was the, it was the, the, the talking with her coach online and at the field. It was, I mean, it was everything. It just encompassed all that she did. She went into strict training because it was that important. And that's the imagery Paul's calling upon. He's like, man, life is not theater. Life is a fight. Get in the gym. Life is a race. You better have some endurance. This whole concept of I'm going to lay down my rights for the gospel, it's not going to be easy. We're not play acting here. This is going to encompass all of your life. There's no days off. Demands discipline, a fit body, a sound mind, a joyful soul, so that you can face sorrows with endurance. You can face temptation with God's strength. You can face disappointment with eternal hope. I think understanding the theology of this chapter is important. It's actually pretty simple. I'll just read it again. I think verse 12 just makes it so clear. We put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. The proclamation of that gospel is what is most important. So pretty easy to understand. I think convicting to live out. So I'm going to ask some questions. I, I don't know how these land in your life and where you're at right now. I trust that the Holy Spirit can use this to both convict and encourage us to faithful living. So based on verse 12, what rights are you so accustomed to and attracted to that you're unwilling to yield them for the sake of the gospel? What rights are you so accustomed to or attracted to that you're unwilling to yield them for the sake of the gospel. I, I can't say that word rights without thinking of the Bill of Rights in our country. I love our country. I think that American exceptionalism is a real thing. Not in any way that an American life is more valuable than any other life on this planet throughout history, but I think we have a a founding history that is largely built upon this and other countries lack that and you've seen the fruit of that for the last 250 years almost. And yet, I think as Christians, if we hold on to our Bill of Rights and are unwilling to sacrifice these for the proclamation or the hindrance of the gospel, I think that is an idol. So, First Amendment to the Bill of Rights, freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of assembly, freedom of religion. Are you so compelled that you have to speak even though it might hinder the gospel? Are you willing to shut up so you won't hinder the gospel? On the flip side, maybe you're one that's drawn to more passivity. Are you willing to speak up for the proclamation of the gospel? Second Amendment, I know nobody here cares about that one, but if, if you did, are you willing to lay down your arms for the proclamation of the gospel? Let me ask you this, are you willing to take up arms for the defense of the gospel? I think that's a far more tricky one, but let me nuance that one over coffee. Whatever, whatever right you're drawn to in the Bill of Rights, I'll tell you this, according to chapter 9 in 1 Corinthians, you need to be willing to lay those down so that the gospel is not hindered. Praise God we live in a country that actually I think those rights protect the proclamation of the gospel more than hinder. But believers, if we hold on to the more, those more dearly than what it looks like to advance the gospel, we have an idol, we have a problem. How about this? Let me change gears. How about the right, and I tried to word this <clears throat> openly, the right to present yourself authentically to others. The right to present yourself authentically to others. We have a right to dress how we want to dress, Christian. I think some of us need to remember that we should lay down that right to not cause other believers to stumble and for the proclamation of the gospel. Swimsuit season. Just think about that. 
I, I recognize some people spend a lot of time in the gym working out, dieting, just so they can have kind of like a fit bod. That doesn't mean you have a right to show It means you have a right to show it off. It means sometimes it's actually helpful to lay that down so you don't hinder the gospel with how you look. Our wealth. Christians have a right to be wealthy. How you flaunt that right actually can hinder the gospel. Position, power, goals. We have rights to all that as believers. We have freedom for that. And yet, how we present those to other people actually can have a real impact on how we declare and how the gospel is received. How about our emotions? We should be authentic with our emotions, right? We have every right to be angry, excited, sad, joyful, frustrated. Those are rights. Maybe you should lay down some of those rights, the outrage, the happiness, so that we can mourn with those who mourn and rejoice with those who rejoice to not hinder the gospel. How about, okay, how about the right to participate in politics? Whether you're running for office or voting for office, you, we, man, God bless that right we have. I hope we all participate in some way in that. I hope we do that in a way that does not hinder the gospel. Now, we're going to have plenty of opportunity in the next 24, 48 hours before this assassination attempt is forgotten about and there's something new to post memes and link articles on our Facebook or Instagram or put something on Twitter. Like, we're going to have plenty of opportunity. You can do that. You have every right. I want you to consider if that's going to hinder the gospel or advance the gospel. There's already going to be conspiracy theories abounding about this. Inside jobs, Russians, aliens. Like, I don't even know. I don't have to know. I just, I know where my own mind goes. Like, maybe not the most helpful thing for the sake of the gospel to put that online. We have a right to entertainment. Movies, music, social media. Drink a beer while you're watching. You have those rights, Christian. Don't exercise those in a way that's going to hinder the gospel. Let me put it this way to summarize. You have a right to anything that is fair and good and just, and there's many things like that in this world, but it's never worth the hindering of the gospel. Now, we can become hyper-legalists here and say, well, I saw you do this and I saw you do that, and then they're wrong and they're wrong, and I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to be the... Like, don't become a Pharisee. Recognize that there's freedom in Christ. Don't judge your brother or sister for what they post tonight. Don't judge your brother and sister for their yard sign or where you see them, what movie you watch them going into at Tinseltown. Seek the Spirit. Find out what it's like to declare the gospel where you live and work and play in your neighborhood and your job and your family. And don't hinder the gospel there. Let me ask the second question. Who in your life do you need to work on getting getting the art of getting alongside them. Who in your life do you need to work for the art of getting alongside them? This is the idea where Paul talks about becoming all things to all people by all possible means that I might save some for the sake of the gospel. Who is it in your life? There's got, there's got to be some people that you can say, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lay down this passion I have. I'm going to lay down this thing. I'm going to lay down this thing. I'm going to go to my vegetarian friend's house. And I'm not going to bring meat. I'm not going to make a stink about it. Like I'm going to go to my neighbor's house that's got the Biden, Harris, or maybe it's going to be Harris Biden. I don't know. I'm not going to go there. But uh, you're going to go there and you're not going to wear the MAGA hat. You're going to just talk to him about the Lord. Maybe ask him, like, why, why is it that you love Biden? Why is it that you love Trump? Like, I'd love to know. And actually, if you dig down deep enough, you might actually have some common convictions. You could have like a real discussion rather than just like talking points and platitudes, just weaponizing stuff like, man, who do you need to get alongside of? Without ever compromising the gospel message or biblical morality. Last question, based on verse 25. What temporary crowns are you striving for that need to be removed, replaced, or reprioritized considering eternal crowns? So the idea was, I think we have a picture of this, was that the, the winner of the Isthmian Games, they'd receive this laurel wreath crown, right? There it is. Now I want you to imagine what that crown looks like three days after the Games. 
right? Probably not many athletes wearing it around. It's all saggy over their face. Like, now how many crowns do we have like that in our lives? This, this is such a big deal. It's so important. It's like, it's everything right now. And in reality, in 10 years from now, in 20 years from now, it's just going to be a saggy Laurel Lareth crown. How about sports? I know many people play, watch, or parent those that are involved in sports. I love sports. Sports are cool. We have a church program for soccer for sports. Like Sports are great as a conduit to share the gospel. And they make terrible crowns. So whether you're playing, whether you're watching, or whether you're a parent of, that, I'm just going to remind you, that is a temporary crown. In five years, in ten years, the sports you're playing today will probably mean nothing. You've got an all-star middle schooler, high schooler. In ten years from now, I will take this bet seven days out of seven. How much you want to bet that kid's still playing that sport? Okay. Sports, temporary. Career. Man, just hyper-focused on the career. Just climbing the ladder. Moving up the company chain. If you're in college because you, there's this spectacular career you have. I mean, careers are great. You're getting paid to go on mission in your career. I hope we see it like that. And yet, if your career is like what it's all about, you just can't wait to retire and look at all the, the whatever employee of the month signs you got on the wall, whew, that's going to be a saggy crown be gone. You'll be, you'll be 80 years old one day thinking, man, I spent so many hours, 50, 60, 70 hours a week, investing in something that is just a saggy, droopy, laurel wreath crown. How about, I wasn't quite sure how to word this, thing accumulation and maintenance. maintenance. Things. Man, the cars, the trucks, the house, the phone, the clothes, the things. Got to accumulate them. Man, I, just, I mean, I love things. I can be a gear nerd. I like stuff. Like, I just want it, and I got to maintain it, and then you want more, and pretty soon your life, life is just a cycle of acquisition and maintenance, acquisition and maintenance. And at some point, you're going to realize this stuff's going to burn. It's going to rot. Somebody's going to steal it. Somebody's going to inherit it that I don't even know. Your yard, your car, your house, your clothes, your toys... Gentlemen, how much time have you spent working on your front yard this summer? Someone is going to buy your house when you die, and they're going to replant it. It's going to look nothing like it does now. It's going to burn. Like literally, in 115 degree heat, things burn. <laughs> and yet we're out there, like I'm going to say we because I'm, I'm in on this one. Like we're mowing, we're trimming, we're weeding, we're adjusting the sprinklers, we're fixing the valves. This temporary stuff is a laurel wreath crown. How about a retirement of ease, travel, relax, RVs, golf, games, bunko? <laughs> oh, man. I got, I won't say who. Somebody's shaking their finger at me in the back. Uh, <laughs> clearly struck a nerve on that one. Take a note. <laughs> like, I, man, games are great. Retirement is great. I... Hope you can all retire from a career and invest in full-time ministry to win a real crown. If your idea of retirement is just, man, I'm going to hook up the Winnebago and a, and, a, and a Vespa and I'm just going to hit the beach, I'm going to travel around and do the national park thing, cool, but you better have a bigger plan in mind or that Winnebago is going to break down. You're going to lose at Bunko. <laughs> golf, your golf game is it's, it's going, like if you're retired, your golf game is getting worse and worse at this point. I don't, like that's just nature. These are temporary crowns. We need to see them as stuff. Like, we can leverage these things for the gospel, or they can become a hindrance to the gospel. You get to pick. You want a boat? Get a boat. You want to win a bago? Get a, you want to play bunko? Play it. Play it for the glory of the Lord and to proclaim his gospel to the people you're doing it with, rather than becoming the thing it's all about, become this saggy, fading crown. Lay down your rights for the sake of the gospel. Maybe you're here this morning, and you're like, man, I've heard you say gospel like 4,002 times. I've been counting. Well, Paul says it a lot, so I'm just trying to echo Paul here. Like, here there's got to be a question like, you're, this is a big ask, Mike. 
These are huge asks. I'm going to repeat. What are your rights you can lay down? Who do you need to get alongside with? And what temporary crowns can you lay down? These are huge asks. Is it worth it? God became man. He died on the cross. He rose again to save us from that bondage to prison and cancer. But it wasn't a literal prison. It wasn't real cancer. It was cancer, a sickness of the soul, leading to eternal death and damnation in hell. And he gave up heaven, and he became a man, and he died and bled on the cross, and he rose again so we can have new life in him. If that's not motivation enough, that is the gospel. And that faith in Jesus as our Lord and Savior then frees us from those chains, frees us from that cancer, and we get to go into the inheritance of God, into his kingdom. That's the motivation. That's the message we need to share. That's, that's, man, that's what it's all about. And anything that hinders my ability to talk to you about that, man, I got to lay that down. And if, if my ability, man, if I, I like to hunt, and if my need and desire and love of hunting comes in the way of someone that just like loves animals, man, I got to lay that down. At least don't talk about it. Maybe we're willing to sacrifice it entirely for the sake of that. I would ask that you would pray over those things. What rights have you become so accustomed to that you're unwilling to yield them? Who in your life do you need to get alongside for the sake of the gospel? And what temporary crowns are you striving for that need to be removed, replaced, or reprioritized for the sake of the gospel? Let's pray. You are so good to us, Lord. Praise you for your mercy and your goodness and your love. Thank you that we're made new in you, that our sins are gone, imputed to you on the cross, Lord. Thank you that although we still live in this broken and hurting and sinful condition, Lord, you don't see us like that. You see us with the righteousness of Christ. So we give you our praise. Lord, may we be willing to lay down whatever it takes so that the gospel might go forward. Lord, I just pray, especially as Americans, that you would help us understand our primary allegiance to you with a secondary allegiance to our country and know how to manage that in this difficult season. We pray for our country. We pray for peace, but Lord, we pray for revival, that people would turn to Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior here in America. Lord, I pray if there's anyone here this morning that has not accepted your gospel, Lord, that this morning they would come to know you, that they would put their faith in you as their Lord and Savior. Thank you that they can do that right here, right now. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would even be working during this second set of music just to convict and encourage our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.
without you holding my hand. I think I'll make Jesus my all and all. And when I'm in trouble, in His name I'll call. And if I don't trust Him, I'd be less of a man. Lord, I can't even walk without you holding my hand. I can't even walk without you holding my hand. The mountain's too high and the valley's too wide. Down on my knees, that's where I learned to stand. And Lord, I can't even walk without you holding my hand and down on my knees that's where i learned to stand and lord i can't even walk without you holding my hand no i can't even walk without you holding my hand got another hand clapper here get ready keep the get tempo ready. up folks keep the tempo we're going. gonna cook yeah. <laughs> one two three Life is over, I'll fly away To a home on God's celestial shore has flown
good job out there with that all clapping. We'll pay you on the way out. <laughs> yeah. As we get ready to close with this last song, um, I hope something that you heard today touched your heart. And especially with the pastor's teaching. Um, there's somebody out there that would like somebody to come alongside them. He talked about us going out and coming along somebody else. But if there's somebody out there that would like somebody to come alongside them and ask questions about what is a Christian? What is the gospel? Who is Jesus? I'd hope that you'd have the courage to just come up to me, come up to Mike, come up to one of the elders, and just ask questions. That's all we ask. As I travel through this pilgrim land, there is a friend who walks with me. Safely through the sinking sand is the Christ of Calvary. This would be my prayer, dear Lord, each day to help me do the best I can. For I need thy light to guide me day and night. Blessed Jesus, hold my hand. Jesus, hold my hand. Travel in the light divine that I may see the blessed way. Keep me that I may be holy thine and see redemption song someday. I will be a soldier brave and true and ever firmly take a stand as I onward go and daily meet the foe. Blessed Jesus, oh my. Jesus.
Jesus, oh my name. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you laid down your rights and emptied yourself, became a man and died on the cross on our behalf. And Lord, in that example, I pray we would be willing to lay down our lives for you. And whatever that looks like, so that we could share the good news of salvation by faith in Christ with those that are around us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you all.